Bom, pessoal, bom dia, boa tarde a todos. Né? Obrigado pela presença. Conforme for passando o tempo, provavelmente o pessoal vai, vai chegando, que já confirmaram. So, we're going to start our speak with Professor Zabi. I'm going to read a brief introduction of him. And after that, we're going to celebrate the 25, the 20, yeah, 25 uh, master program year. It's a, like a small celebration. And we're going to launch our congress. We call Adjikonch. And we're going to have our congress in October. Professor Marcelo is our coordinator. After that, we can, he can actually uh, say uh, a really brief uh, comment about this, uh, this event of our uh, university. Our event now is open for submission. So you are, we are receiving some papers until okay, July 31st. So Professor Zabi, thank you for your presence. For your presence. Professor Zabi is the Thompson Hill Chair of Excellence and Professor of Accountancy at the University of Memphis. And he has served a two-year term of, on the Standing Advisory Group of the PCOB. He received his BS degree from the Iranian Institute of Advanced in Accounting, his MBA from Tarleton State University in Texas, and his PhD from the University of Mississippi. He holds 10 certifications, and I personally ask him, what is the secret? I have like two, and he has 10. So like CPA, CFA, CMA, CIA, and other like seven. So congrats. He served for two years, the Secretary of Forensic and Investigative Accounting section of the AAA, serving on Auditing Standards Committee of the Auditing section of the AAA, and he is current editor of the Journal of Forensic Accounting Research on the AAA journals. He's currently serving on the advisory panel of Hong Kong Financial Reporting Council. He has taught financial, managerial, accounting, auditing, corporate governance, organizational ethics, and businesses to sustainability at the undergrad, graduate, and PhD levels. He has published over 20, 20, uh, 225 articles made more 250 presentations. Now maybe update to more than 20 and 51, 251 presentations. Oh, 252 presentations. <laughs> and written uh, 11 books chapters. So it's a pleasure for us having you here. And I hope you enjoy your presentation. And we are here to ask questions and have a like a debate sure. when you but thank okay. you Lucas and thank you for inviting me today and I appreciate coming to this presentation uh, I appreciate this invitation this is the first time in Rio in Brazil and I really enjoy particularly Pierre being so kind to me taking me around and I really appreciate that uh, I will try to, within one hour or so, share with you some of my research, teaching and experience in business sustainability and the use of technology in the business sustainability. Lucas gave a good summary of my credentials and thank you for very nice introduction. Uh, I have now more than 269 publications, and my latest publication would be in September of Accounting Review, which is our highest level journal in accounting, and I have 14 books. My today's presentation comes from my books, uh, and I'm from University of Memphis, so I live in Memphis, Tennessee. There are three famous things in Memphis, Tennessee. Do you know what are those? Memphis is famous for three things. What do you say, Pierre? <laughs> no. No. Uh, the first thing is pork barbecue. 
pork barbecue is very famous in Memphis, beef barbecue in Texas and others, but pork, and it shows. I eat too much of it. Elvis Presley, how many of you remember Elvis Presley? Here, you, you remember Elvis, the king of rock and roll and, 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 and. Elvis Presley's uh, grave is in Memphis. We call it uh, Great uh, Land or and Memphian believes that Memphis, uh, I mean, that uh, Elvis is still in Memphis and he's alive. So if you go to the Graceland, there is a particular room like this room. Your phone, and they give you a particular phone number. If you dial that number and wait long enough, Elvis would respond to you. That's the story. <laughs> and the third thing is, FedEx. FedEx headquarters is in Memphis, and our university get a lot of uh, basically support from FedEx. And the fourth one is me. <laughs> so, uh, in terms of publication, 14 books that I have published, and I continue to work on more publication. Welcome. We just started, so we haven't missed anything. Like I said, my presentation comes from my book. This book on corporate sustainability, I published that book in 2012, when there was less discussion on business sustainability, and I co-authored that with the with partner of Ernst & Young, and that book received Axiom Gold Award, which is the highest one. And, and in this book, we focus on basically five dimensions of sustainability performance, economic, governance, Ethic, uh, ethical, environmental, and social. And I'll talk about those dimensions throughout my presentation. Then I was asked to publish this book in 2015, which basically we divided our sustainability performance into two main sections, financial economic sustainability performance and non-financial environmental, social, and governance. And ethics is integrated into both, okay? Ethics is an important element of sustainability. I will talk about that shortly. Then this, I was in Asia, and I used to go to Hong Kong a lot. Lucas mentioned that I worked, in, I mean, I taught at Polytechnic University, and I'm still serving on Accounting and Financial Advisory Council of, uh, of Hong Kong. So I got to know several uh, colleagues and we wrote a book on business sustainability in Asia, 12 countries in Asia, corporate social responsibility, and that book got a lot of attention. And finally, this is the book that I, textbook that I published in 2019, but it's, it's been revised uh, and focuses on three important educational topics now. Business sustainability, right? Corporate governance and organizational ethics. These are very three important topics in accounting and universities being asked and accounting department to integrate all these three topics into their business and accounting curriculum. So that's 30 chapters, four modules, and I use that. And this one was published by Harvard Business Review. Uh, this is uh, first uh, uh, on profit with purpose, which basically saying that, yes, the business of business is to make money, to increase shareholders' value, but the company should have some purpose. Giving back to community, society, uh, uh, focusing on diversity, inclusion, and those kind of things. So they have to define their purpose. The first segment of my talk today is start with some questions. <laughs> Why are environmentalists bad at playing cards? Peter, Peter, you already know that because I, why do you think environmentalists are not good in playing cards? That relates to sustainability. That's the hint. Well, they like to avoid the flush. Ah. 
Second one, why does a Time Magazine survey state that only 85% of Americans think global warming is happening? How about the other 15%? Why they don't believe in that? Well, because they work for oil and gas industry. <laughs> and the last one that I have here, how bad was the BP Gulf uh, oil spill? It was so bad, honestly. It was so bad that they, they start drilling for water. <laughs> so anyway, uh, these are, let me start with a definition of sustainability as I have it in my books and in my presentation. I define business sustainability as a process. The journey is not one event, a process of achieving economic financial performance for shareholders to generate desired rate of return for investors. The business of business is to make money for shareholders. At the same time, also achieving non-financial, economic, uh, uh, social, environmental, and governance, ESG, to protect the interest of other stakeholders other than shareholders. Does it make sense? So basically the framework for my book is talking about long-term strat strategies for corporations to desirable, sustainable performance. Like I said, the business of business is to make money for shareholders. Within this framework, of making money for shareholders, the companies that they conduct their business ethically, right? Unlike Enron, WorldCom, and there are some examples, even in Brazil, the companies that they conduct their business ethically, they have a good customer base, have a good reputation, like Google, Microsoft, and others. They take care of their customers. They don't produce products or services that are detrimental to society. For example, to, to, tobacco industry is an, an example. There are some other examples. And they care about the environment. They live a better environment for the next generations. Those that basically take care of their employees, have a good work environment for their employees promote diversity, inclusion, and other things. So those within the framework of making money for shareholders, companies that they conduct their business ethically and environmentally friendly and have a good customer base and others, you stay in the business longer. And when they stay in the business longer, they add to their bottom line's earnings and make more money for shareholders. See, there are Create a company today, maximize profit for several years, dissolve that company, establish another, hello, establish another company and, and do the same over and over. That old economic model is not applicable in the current global technological environment. You cannot do that because the Interest cost is high, the exit house cost is much higher. So companies like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and others, they try to improve their image and reputation and, 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 and is important. So they, they, they try to focus on sustainability. I have to admit that sustainability, even as of now, is more of green washing and branding. If you go to websites of any high profile company, you just go to the websites. What do you see? The first page, we are sustainable. But are they actually focusing on sustainability and are explained about the components of sustainability? In most cases, it's more of branding, greenwashing. You want to impress others. 
they do not really integrate sustainability into their corporate culture, business environment, supply chain management, financing. They don't do that. Not yet, but we are getting there. We are, uh, I'm very optimistic about the future of sustainability. So that's how I define sustainability here. Some of the terms that I use, uh, and I'm not going to go through those, but uh, for example, ESP stands for Economic Sustainability Performance, ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance, and so on. Hey. Hola. I want to say, you come with us. Did I say it right, Peter? I try. <laughs> Well, before you came, are you a professor here? No student. I told Lucas that usually in the United States, when professors or students come late, you wait five minutes for associate assistant professors to arrive. 10 minutes for associate professor, 15 minutes for full professor like Pierre, and uh, for chair of excellence as long as it takes. So we waited for everybody, Lucas, about 10 minutes. And, but anyway, uh, another concept is the concept of profit with purpose, which basically means that companies, yes, they, their business is to uh, increase shareholders' wealth, but they should have some other purposes. The example of purposes could be giving back to community. Uh, uh, basically uh, having environmentally friendly uh, uh, strategies, not polluting the environment, uh, hiring minorities, and, and so on. So they should have some purposes beyond and above maximizing profit for shareholders. And this has become very important in U.S. because in 2019, I don't know why the pointer is not, Showing there, but not showing here. <laughs> That's a mystery. See, I can show everything here, everything there, everything here, everything above. But when I go here, where is the technology guy? Maybe he knows. No, there's no problem. No, I'm just joking. There's no problem. So business roundtable updated the statements of corporate purpose which was published in August of 2019 and signed by 181 well-known high-profile CEOs of high-profile companies like FedEx, Google, Amazon, and others. And they said, it's about time that we need to change the purpose of corporations. Because legally, under the old uh, article of incorporation, the purpose is to protect the interest of shareholders. They said, we have to go beyond that. And, and that's what the profit, the profit with purpose means that you have to take care of the environment. The framework that I use in my book is based on long-term sustainable performance. And the purpose is to create shared value for all stakeholders, not only shareholders, but employees, customers, suppliers, everybody else, and looking at long-term horizon is not based on short-term uh, bidding or meeting analyst expectation and making your quarterly earnings. No, the focus of management and board of directors should be in long-term strategic performance. And that's, that's what is good about sustainability. And there are five components or dimensions of sustainability performance, as I mentioned. The most important one is economic, uh, financial economic sustainability performance, then environmental, social governance, uh, and uh, uh, ethics is integrated into all components. All of the new standards that comes from GRI and others focusing on four components. And ethics is basically integrated into financial and non-financial components. Why it is important? Because now we have a variety of stakeholders. 
Uh, of course, the main stakeholders they would consider as shareholders, but we have government, we have in, uh, environment, employees, suppliers, customers, society, future generation, communities, and NGOs, and others. So companies have to basically take care of all stakeholders and protect their interest and create shared value for all the stakeholders. I usually take my talk as a workshop, and as a workshop, you're welcome to ask questions anytime. Uh, you can hold your question until the end, or please jump in and ask any question. So during my presentation, please welcome to ask questions. So there are many stakeholders, and we have to take care of them. But when companies try to take care of not only shareholders, other stakeholders, there should be a tension in, in there, right? There is always a tension. Because those who rightfully or wrongfully believe that the business of business is to make money for shareholders, right? If you take the resources and spend it on environment or community or society, it's just like taking money from shareholders and give it to others. That's one point of view. And this point of view is still uh, uh, relevant in, in US and other places. The other point of view said no. The business of business is to make money. This is the main function. But within this function, if you take care of your customers, society, community, and environment, you will be more sustainable in the long term and you add to bottom line earnings. So which one is better? To focus in on sustainability, of course. Why we need to focus on sustainability? Because this is based on actual data. If you go online, you see the same thing here. Components of S&P 500 market value. What are the components of market value of S&P 500? Well, in 1975, Intangible assets, including reputation, goodwill, and, and uh, 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 human skills, and other things, just counted for only a small portion, 10, 15 percent of total value of the stock. By year 2020, it's about 90 percent. So investors pay attention to non-financial information, and the stock price reflects the investors' preferences for intangibles. And therefore, management should not be only a steward of financial capital provided by shareholders, but also human capital provided by employees, uh, environmental capital, manufacturing capital, reputational capital. So management is responsible to protect the interest of everybody, environment, employees, shareholders, and others. That's what we call that. What are the drivers of long-term value? Uh, talented employees, of course, is one. Uh, uh, innovation and uh, consumer trends, society and environment, and corporate governance, these are the ones that basically encourage move toward sustainability. And the question is, why we should care about business sustainability and why now? Well, in my books and research that I do, I differentiate between two things, business sustainability and ESG sustainability. Business sustainability look at more of financial long-term strategic plan. ESG focuses on non-financial environmental, social, and governance, and they're both important. One bad perception in the U.S. is that some just focus on diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, and they said ESG is about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and some businesses in the U.S., especially Republican-focused uh, businesses, don't like that. ESG goes beyond diversity, inclusion, and equity. 
ESG focuses on environmental, social, and governance, and as part of it is diversity, equity, and inclusion. But why is gaining attention? For several reasons. First, ESG information is demanded by investors. If you look at, for example, I am regular investors through my 401k retirement, I invest in more than 20 companies. When I talk to my portfolio managers, there is a box that I can check that I would like to invest in socially responsible companies. And I do. Check that box. So as even retail investors, I focus on social response. As a three asset managers of Vanguard, BlackRock, and, and Straight Street that managing more than 90% of mutual funds, portfolios, and others, every year they put out a report that they, need, they focus on, on ESG. And investors taking, they are interested in two things about ESG, risk and opportunity. If there is an opportunity for them to get a better return on investment, they invest in ESG or socially responsible company. And also they assess the risk. What's the risk of non-compliance with, uh, with uh, sustainability? What is going to do to their wealth investment? So investors are interested in risk and opportunity associated with ESG and research shows that. So investors demand information on ESG. When investors demand information on ESG, companies produce and disclose ESG information because it's demanded by investors, right? Investors are the owner. So, and right now more than 15,000 uh, companies, which I think is more than that, that throughout the year uh, world that uh, focusing on ESG and producing ESG sustainability reports. And most importantly, mandated by regulators. Starting in 2017, all large European companies, more than 6,000, should not only disclose financial statements or financial reports, but also reports on environmental, social, and governance and diversity. So it's mandated, they have to do that. And recently, as of last year, European Union came up with the new standards. They call it sustainability reporting guidelines. And all these companies should follow this guideline in the preparation of what they call it integrated sustainability report. All of these guidelines are seen very differently when we compare the public sector and private sector. That's an excellent question. Uh, the focus is more on uh, uh, public companies and the guidelines for them, but those guidelines are applicable to private companies uh, not-for-profit organization, everything else. One thing that I see in U.S. is with Sustainability Accounting Standard Board. Sustainability Accounting Standard Board classifies industries into 82 and have different sections, guidelines for different industries. For example, the sustainability initiatives and guidelines that would work for oil and gas industry should focus on environmental is different from sustainability guidelines for banking industry that should focus on such, uh, customer satisfaction. So you're exactly right. Different industries, different organizations, private, public, they should have separate standards. But we are not there yet, Pierre. It takes time. <laughs> we just started on guidelines for sustainability in general, and I'll tell you why. It takes time, but that's the way it should be. So is demanded, required by regulators throughout the world. In Asia, when I was in Hong Kong in 2015, integrated sustainability reporting became the mandatory in, in Hong Kong. In, in China, it's the same thing. 
And in U.S., we are one step behind uh, European countries usually. But even in U.S., now, uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, which is the most important regulator in the U.S., requiring or had a proposal on uh, climate change and human capital and human capital management. And step by step, they get into the other components of sustainability. So we are getting there, Pia. We are not there yet, but we are getting there. And even for educators, well, as we all know, the educators are one step beyond the industry and practice. Uh, so, but with the educators, I have seen more than 250 articles and I have published more than 10 myself in the past 10 years on sustainability. So scholars like yourself and others focus on research in sustainability. American Accounting Association, which is the largest uh, organization uh, for accountants throughout the world. Last February, had two days conference on just business sustainability and ESG sustainability and how these two should be integrated into the business and accounting curriculum. I had two panels there, I made a presentation and they're planning to have the same thing Next year in February, it will be in Washington, D.C. I encourage you to attend. That's very, very, very rich uh, conference. And, of course, I'll be there as one of the keynote speakers. That's why I promote that. Currently, I'm working with the leadership of American Accounting Association, trying to establish what I call it sustainability accounting section. Similar to international accounting section, or management accounting section, or tax section, or others. And um, I was asked to prepare a survey, and the survey was sent to all members of uh, AAA, American Accounting Association, last January. And 480 responded, 486 exactly. And 90% of them said that, yeah, there, there's a need for creation of the section. That's why I'm working with Yale University, Harvard University, Chicago, Texas, and others, trying to get them to support creation of the section. So, and, and, and we, I, I did a study that more than 450 university, universities throughout the world integrating sustainability into their finance, accounting, supply chain. We have a supply chain sustainability center in many places. So we are getting there. It is the future, I believe, integrated sustainability reporting is the future of corporate reporting. So in the future, you don't see only financial statements, you see integrated sustainability reporting, which consists of financial statements as well as non-financial statements. And these financial statements audited by CPAs, non-financial reports would be also audited by CPAs. I'll get to that shortly. So for this reason, does it make sense why we should focus on sustainability? If it's demanded by investors, required by regulators and companies report, then in academia, we got to pay attention to. This is also a way to have more uh, grants. From of course. For the federal government, if you have more uh, tests and research in, the, in this area, you can improve more resources from the Ministry of it's sometimes hard to, the, 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 the researchers that try to talk to the, those who decide how to engage money in that ministries. And they say, okay, this average interest in are going to put more money in it. So these studies, you see, you, you, I'm seeing here, you have more than 200 papers published yeah, on CSR and uh, 
a ASG. This is important to, to show because we can then apply and tell them how to you are You're exactly right about that here. Uh, uh, and I used to go there in the summer. It was a requirement that every faculty would apply for a grant. And the grant would be considered as we have ranking for journals A plus A, B, C as a publication. And the idea was to focus on sustainability proposals, grants. And, and Hong Kong government and others supported sustainability. So exactly what you're saying, I experienced that in Hong Kong. Recently, I was talking to one of the professors at the University of Chicago. Usually, usually initiatives start in Chicago and move to Harvard, Yale, and then MIT and others, and then to other universities. That professor is in Chicago saying that this year, only this year, all of the dissertations for all PhD students has to be in sustainability. Can you believe that? So, but when they participation, they got grant. They got big grant. So that's the opportunity, especially for PhD students, students and faculty here to start applying for grants, especially with uh, oil and gas industry and others. It, it, it's so much opportunity to not only advance in your research but also getting grant to support your research and giving back to community with your research outputs so you're exactly right about that uh, in this section I uh, talk about the uh, two models that currently being debated in the United States and throughout the world. One concept is called shareholder capitalism or shareholder pri shareholders privacy, primacy, and the other one is called stakeholder capitalism or stakeholders primacy. These are two different things. Shareholders primacy or capitalism is more common in the United States. Stakeholder capitalism and primacy is more in Europe. But why they are different? Because they have different focus. Welcome. Yep, sit everywhere. <laughs> Basically, under the shareholders' primacy, prim, primacy model, the main purpose of corporation is to generate revenue for shareholders. The main purpose is to increase shareholders' wealth. And therefore, the board of, I'm trying to summarize the next few slides here. Therefore, the board of directors who represent shareholders and protect shares or shareholders' rights and interests, their focus and their fiduciary duty is only to shareholders, to protect their interest. That's U.S. model, which is still we are moving away from shareholders' primacy and more to stakeholders, even in U.S., but it's still in U.S., that's the main model that we use. On the other hand, under stakeholder primacy, the focus of corporation should not only be on generating revenue for shareholders, and creating desired rate of return for shareholders, but they should have some environmental impact, social impact. The, the concept of profit with purpose, the 
main objective is to make money, but you have to have other purposes. Focusing on protecting the environment, employees, and uh, reputation, and so on. So these two models being discussed in the business literature now, and many papers being published on these two models. The debate that I see between the scholars are from Harvard University, which promoting shareholder primacy and London Business School that promoting the stakeholders. Sustainable. Yes. I get to that part, you're exactly, okay. this, uh, these are basically are in line and consistent with the uh, United Nations 17 Sustainability Development Goals that should be achieved by year 2030 in all countries. And I'll get to that part shortly. So, so that goes based on this model, uh, basically here, that corporations interact with several stakeholders. So the main one is shareholders. What shareholders do? They provide financial capital to the corporation. What do they expect? Return on their investment, right? How about uh, debt holders? Debt holders also provide debt equity or capital to the corporation and they expect uh, uh, receiving interest on their uh, debt. Uh, how about here, uh, customers? Customers pay cash to receive goods and services that are not detrimental to them. So they pay cash to get a good service and good product. A government, uh, basically, a corporation pays tax, but the government provides them with facilities, roads, and many other things. So that's the main stakeholders. Uh, employees, nowadays, become more important. The focus is not only on financial capital. It's on human capital. Employees provide skills and, and, and human skills and get compensated. So right now, the new standards, particularly in U.S. and everywhere, is on human capital. Guidelines how to measure human capital and the value of human capital. And suppliers basically provide materials and get uh, 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 paid by cash or whatever. So as you see here, the role of society, corporations in society, is not limited to shareholders. It consists of many stakeholders. And the board of directors should protect the interest of all stakeholders and create shared value for all stakeholders. And there should be a system of accountability. The system that hold the board of directors accountable, not only to shareholders or investors, but to other stakeholders and those who make decision, a strategic decision should be held accountable for their decision. That's the system. This system also works at the university, right? Professors are held accountable for good teaching performance, good research performance and service. Uh, and, 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 and Pierre told me that he's evaluating many professors here. So I suppose you have your own criteria of evaluation based on teaching. To me, teaching is, should come first. The reason that we are here at the university is, is to transfer our knowledge to the next generation. So teaching should be first. It's given. As a teacher, we are a good performer. As a performer, we should be able to communicate and transfer our knowledge to a student. Then research is important because it keeps professors up to date. And that's what we're talking about, academic sustainability. 
<laughs> That's part of it. And of course, service is very important. Even though I'm a chair of excellence, uh, basically, uh, uh, I teach limited courses, PhD level courses, but uh, my research books are very important to university. And not only that, my services. I'm chairing budget and finance committee of faculty senate. That's the highest point, which I'm sitting on university budget council, talking to president, provost about budgets and everything on, on regular basis. They use my expertise. Lucas, you mentioned about 10 certifications. They have value. <laughs> and, and they utilize that and, 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 and I provide my services to university. As part of the services to universities, bringing more reputation and international exposure to University of Memphis, like coming here and giving a talk and others. So these are academic sustainability is also important. But going back to shareholders and stakeholders primacy, let me get to, since we don't have much time, to one slide. And uh, Lucas, please make every slide available to everybody. Uh, so you're welcome to have a copy of those. And with the limited time that uh, Lucas has given to me, I have to go a little bit fast. <laughs> but usually, based on my experience, uh, I'm keynote speakers in many places, you cannot keep attention of the audience more than one hour. Human beings in <laughs> mind. <laughs> There's a little more than one hour. So I try to finish my talk within one hour. Uh, the reason that uh, this uh, uh, stakeholder primacy is very important because even in the United States, uh, the, the high profile uh, companies and their CEOs and CFOs focusing on uh, uh, new purpose for corporation and the statements of the purpose for corporation and focus on profit with purpose. So that's why it is important. And by the same token, we have shareholders governance, like corporate governance that I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, and stakeholder governance. And these two have different measures. So the measures that work for shareholder governance would be different than stakeholder governance. And basically, even in the US, there is a move away from shareholders' capitalism or primacy to more of a stakeholders' capitalism and primacy because many new regulations by senators and others moving toward that direction, uh, even in, in the United States. Uh, let me go continue with these slides, which basically give a good summary of differences between shareholders' governance and stakeholders' governance. Under shareholders' governance, under both uh, governance, the uh, investors elect board of directors, and board of directors appoint executives to run the business for the purpose of uh, best benefit of owners and the stakeholders. Under shareholders' governance, legally in U.S. and the board of directors basically oversee managerial performance and decisions. The board of directors' responsibility is not to micromanage the company, but appoint the most competent and ethical CEOs and CFOs and other managers to run the organization for the benefit of owners. So, and in the US, the board of directors do a great job in appointing the most ethical and competent executives, CEOs, CFOs, and others. What they have failed to do is to remove these executives when they become incompetent or unethical. 
And I suppose it's the same thing throughout the world. It's hard to remove the individuals who become either incompetent in their position, even as a professor, as executives, and or unethical. There is studies that I have done and others that in the past 10 years, the performance in some companies going, keep going down when the executive compensation keep going up and executives keep their job. So this is the job of board of directors to remove them when they become incompetent or unethical. But basically board of directors under shareholders primacy oversee uh, managerial functions uh, to make sure that managers work for the best benefit of shareholders. Under stakeholders primacy, this duty, fiduciary duty extended to all the stakeholders. The board of directors want to make sure that managers not only focusing on financial capital, but also human capital, environmental capital, reputational capital, manufacturing capital, supply chain management capital, and so on. So we see the differences in general. In terms of management under shareholders primacy, management responsibility is basically is to shareholders. Management focus is on maximizing profit or e increasing shareholders' wealth. Under stakeholder primacy, which is much broader, executives not only report on financial performance, right? But also non-financial ESG performance. So executives should report, we call that integrated sustainability report of financial information and non-financial ESG information. So their job would be different or basically much broad. The same thing for the auditors. After Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which I'm sure you're familiar with that, auditors not only auditing financial statements of public companies, but also the system of internal control. So under section 404 of Sarbanes-Oxley, auditors audit financial statements and the system of internal control and express opinion on both financial statements and the system of internal control. Under shareholders, capitalism or primacy. Under stakeholder capitalism, this responsibility is extended. So auditors express opinion on financial statements, internal control, but they also provide some assurance on ESG information. Basically, the reason that we have the auditor is to lend credibility to information presented by management, right? So you have an independent third party providing some sort of assurance. So under stakeholder primacy, the, this type of the assurance is not only on financial information, but also non-financial ESG information. For that reason, I have seen some move in the US toward B corporation or benefit corporations. To summarize the, the next few slides, benefit under conventional corporations, the fiduciary duty of the board of directors is to the shareholders and management works for shareholders. Under benefit corporation, it goes, the companies in their uh, article of incorporation focusing not only on financial, but having some purpose. The purpose can be defined by shareholders. We want to focus on environment. We want to focus on diversity. We want to focus on whatever they want, whatever purpose they choose to have. And that's the benefit corporation. I was hoping 10 years ago, I wrote an article about benefit corporation and I was expecting that all the conventional corporations would convert to benefit corporation because it makes more common sense. But as of now, I haven't seen any high profile companies 
convert into B company or benefit corporation. It's not happening because money talks, money walks, money everything. <laughs> so, but for your information, right now more than 37 states in the United States allow creation of B corporation if the companies try to do. In fact, they have some, uh, they ha can have dual objectives of doing well and doing good or doing well by doing good. So that's dual objective. Doing well by doing good and fiduciary duties to our stakeholders. And they have some, even some procedures for them how they can opt in or opt out of big corporation. But the, the requirement is very tough. 90% of outstanding shareholders should approve of converting to big corporation. It's not happening, but I have seen that in, in Asia and other places that they use this big corporation. I don't know whether in Brazil it is common at all, but uh, it's for you to do research in this area. That's a good uh, topic of research uh, to find out about big corporations. I have more information on the other slides. As I mentioned, even in the United States, there is more focus on sustainability. And the reason is that the legislators and regulators are coming up with the new regulations. As I mentioned, in 2019, the statements of the purpose for the company, the, the, the Climate Risk Disclosure Act of 2019, uh, Accountability Capitalism Act of 2018 by Senator Warren, which basically requires that at least two-fifths of directors be female directors. Now in the U.S., in the state of California, and 10 more states, is the mandatory that at least one member of the board of directors should be female, uh, which is good for diversity and I'm always in favor of diversity. And political spending more than 10,000 should be approved by 75% of shareholders. That bill was introduced in 2018, but has not passed, even during the Democrats uh, regime. Uh, we are having a hard time. Uh, but don't worry, there are many organizations that promoting so not only promoting sustainability, but also creating guidelines for sustainability. You know, those in accounting, you know that in accounting, things that cannot be measured would not be reported. Accountants are good in coming with measures as liability, owner's equity, and as a result, we measure them and we report them in the financial state. For non-financial ESG, the key performance indicators of environmental, social, governance need to be developed. And these key performance indicators should be measured in terms of monetary, somehow, putting value on that. For example, how companies can reduce uh, pollution and how much value you can put on that how companies can focus on human capital and the value of the human capital. The, the companies' donations and giving back to society or communities, those need to be measured in order to be reflected in the, in the report. So, like I said, don't worry. No worries. These uh, organizations are doing that. One is... Uh, Global reporting initiatives started many years ago, and they had the first uh, guidelines called G3 guidelines, then they had G4 guidelines, and now they have global sustainability guidelines, and basically providing guidelines for corporations. Uh, companies can basically sign into GRI and, and get some benefits of being the membership in GRI and, and the whole. And if you go to the websites, uh, basically you will see that they have made some progress. Another one is the International Integrated Reporting Council, uh, UK-based. 
and the purpose is to create integrated sustainability report consisting of financial information as well as non-financial information. And Peter, the one that I mentioned to you, Sustainability Accounting and Standard Board in the U.S., uh, basically focusing on different industries, 88, 88 industries, and they have different guidelines for them. And SASB is trying to integrate sustainability into the SEC filings. So companies file 10K report, annual report, or 10Q report with the SEC. They've been trying to work with SEC that sustainability would become mandatory report. But these organizations in the past 10 years worked in isolation. GRI worked here, IRC worked here, and, and US. into how best promote sustainability. Eventually, they got the message. In 2021, International Sustainability Standard Board was created under IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standard. And that's serious. This ISSB, like an umbrella, brought all these organizations together and said, yeah, I work with GRI, I work with the SASB in the U.S. And, and, and any other organization, sustainability organization. But let's have a uniform standard. Don't you think it makes common sense? Like everything else in business and accounting, it takes time. We have to go through the, this more of evolution. So starting in 2021, this uh, uh, organization was created. And as of now, published one standard, general standards on sustainability. They call it S1. S2 is on climate change. And they have a proposal, S3, on human capital and human capital management. And they are creating more internationally accepted sustainability standards that can be, Peter, can be used by for-profit, not-for-profit, in Brazil, in U.S., everywhere. But again, we are not there yet. <laughs> we are getting there. And time will tell. And of course, we have the sustainability standards. International standard organizations, I'm sure you're familiar with that, has several standards. The first one is, was ISO 9000, and that been out for many years, means that trading partners in Brazil should certify in terms of quality control to ISO 9000 in order to do business by trading partners in US or Europe and other places. Uh, we have others, 14,000. ISO 14,000 is on environmental. Environmental management, environmental accounting, environmental auditing, environmental risk assessment, and everything else. Now we have 2121 on sustainability events. Uh, uh, 26,000 become more famous because it focuses on not only on profit, but people and planet. We call that three, uh, three, three per bottom line. Focusing on profit, financial, planet, environment, people, human capital. Recently, the research that I do and others, we add one more P to this performance, and that is prosperity. So planet, people, profit, prosperity. Standard. That makes common sense. And uh, we have ISO 31,000 on risk assessment and others. Uh, in terms of sustainability and business sustainability, 
in my books and research, I focus on three factors of business sustainability. The first one is sustainability performance. And I'll talk about the, 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 the one that I use in my books, five dimensions of sustainability performance. Second one is sustainability risk. Reputational risk, environmental risk, uh, non-compliance with regulations, financial risk, strategic risk, and others. And the third factor is disclosure. Let's say you focus on sustainability performance. How are you going to disclose that to stakeholders? That's the second part. So when it comes to uh, sustainability practices, I have some tips for CEOs and CFOs. Let me focus on this one. There are several tips for board of directors, investors, and executives to promote sustainability. For investors, they have to focus on what I call it impact investing. The investors should not only demand desired rate of return on investment, but they should invest in the companies that have some environment, show some environmental impact and social impact. It's this concept of impact investing become very popular with investors. And for that reason, investors, as I mentioned, when I talk to my portfolio managers, there is a box that I check that I would like to invest in socially responsible companies. And for that reason, I'm willing to accept lower rate of return on my investment if portfolio manager invests in socially responsible companies. So that's the impact investors not only benefiting from rate of return on their investment but also seeing the social impact of their co companies environmental impact we have not resolved the common uh, situations and this makes it much, much more difficult to, to apply. As you say, the you are exactly are right. In highs. order to certify to those uh, yes. ISO standards, they have a series of steps. It would make more sense to apply uh, two or three different levers, depends on the countries, and, and, and uh, yes. Uh, but I'm not sure that we, are, we can do what they expected in, in, in Europe or maybe in, in Canada and then also the U.S. Mm -hmm. and for us in Brazil, that should be a challenge, obviously, uh, opportunities for us in education mm -hmm. and research. But uh, in fact, uh, this is not so easy. You're exactly right. The other thing is tone at the top. At any, this, I teach organizational ethics, and one thing that I try to communicate to students, the importance of tone at the top. The person who is at the top of pyramid, either university, government, corporations, for profit, not for profit, everybody looking up to the leader. If the leader is a good person, that can trickle down to the entire organization. If the person at the top is fraudulent, corrupted person, the entire organization gets corrupted. That applies to every organization. So in order to promote sustainability, we should have a tone at the top, which means board of directors should focus on sustainability. So for that reason, S&P 500 companies have at least one director with sustainability focus. Don't you think that would help to promote sustainability? Of course. In fact, 20% of S&P 500 companies have what is called a sustainability committee, like the audit committee, like the uh, ex uh, compensation committee or nominating committee, which are the committee of board of directors and they are mandatory in the US and many other places. 
they have sustainability committee. And that committee consists of several directors. And when you create that committee, it shows that you really mean it. You want to promote sustainability. Don't you agree? That's for board of directors. For executives, there are several ways to promote. First is to create what is called chief sustainability officer, or some companies call it. I got the report today that the, the, the survey of uh, Russell 3000 companies in US and more than 60% have either chief sustainability officer or chief SEG, uh, ESG officer. So having that chief, chief sustainability officer, the same equivalent to chief executive officer or chief financial officer caused the companies to focus more on sustainability. And the best way, in my judgment, is to put a clause in management contract. Usually companies, when they prepare management contract and how to compensate management, they have a contract, they put many terms that you have to move earnings from point A to point B in the next 10 years and to get compensated for that much. The best way is to put a clause in management contract that if you want to get paid high compensation, you have to focus on ESG as well. Diversity, inclusion, environment, social, and other. So these are the tips that I have here, and it makes common sense to do. Um, and then I have this general uh, sustainability integrated approach, which I look at sustainability performance, sustainability risk, sustainability disclosure, and sustainability theories, and all together in, in the book. Future of here, uh, I said that ISO 26000 focuses on uh, triple bottom line, profit, people, and planet. The primary goal of business has been and continue to be to earn profit uh, in a socially responsible way. Uh, people focusing on human capital, planet, taking care of the environment. But in my book, and here, uh, here is what you are talking about, uh, UN Sustainability Development Goals, which basically covers everything, all dimensions of sustainability. There are 17 goals. For example, goal number one, no poverty in the whole world. And these goals are intended to be achieved totally by year 2030. I'm not sure, time would tell, no poverty in, in the entire world. That would create sustainable world, right? But it's not going to happen. I don't know how soon it's going to happen. Uh, zero hunger, for example. Good health and good well-being. Quality education. Entire world not only in US or Brazil, in Africa, everywhere. Gender equality, that goes with more diversity and others. Clean water and sanitation for the entire world. Affordable clean energy. And, and these 17 goals, some related to governance, some environmental and others, these are important. And these are goals that are supposed to be integrated into the corporate culture, corporate environment, strategic planning, supply chain management, and everything else. Don't you think the whole world would be better off or better place to live if we can implement those? These are extremely high standards of achievement, but at least, if you achieve half of those, you're better off by not really doing anything. So uh, these goals are here. Uh, and disclosure of uh, sustainability, as of now, uh, more than 
30% of S&P 500 have a separate reports on sustainability. Some integrate that into annual reports. Some integrate that into management discussion and analysis. So it depends on that. My hope is that within the next five, 10 years, we'll see the future of corporate reporting in sustainability. There will be integrated sustainability report, which consists of both financial information and non-financial information. Hopefully, it will be integrated in 10K report, hopefully. Uh, BlackRock is one of the three big asset managers, and that has some uh, tips and uh, requirements for uh, investors and, and corporations uh, as well. In my book, books, I focus on five dimensions of sustainability performance. Of course, the first and the most important dimension Unfortunately, I cannot show it here. In the middle one, economic dimension. The financial economic dimension means that the job of the corporation is to generate revenue for shareholders and increase their wealth. And traditionally, we have done a good job in measuring financial performance, in measuring return on investment, for example, in measuring earnings, depreciation, whatever. And financial information is reflected in financial statement. We have done that in many years. Companies produce financial statements and these financial statements being audited by CPAs to lend more credibility to financial information presented by management to stakeholders. So we have done a great job and this area is well standardized as of now. But when we get into the first one, governance performance, which is one dimension of sustainability performance, governance performance is supposed to measure the performance of all what I call corporate gatekeepers, from board of directors, management, advisory function, auditors, internal auditors, external auditors, everybody, to basically measure their performance and hold them accountable. And at the end of the year, prepare a report called governance report, talking about roles and responsibility of board of directors, management, executives, auditors, and everybody, and how well they have achieved their uh, goals and hold them accountable. But in order to do that, you need to have some standards to measure board of directors' performance, which is being done on a regular basis, and report on that and have assurance providers to provide some assurance about management report on governance. Ethics is a very sensitive area, because when it comes to ethics, it depends some uh, say that ethics is more related to uh, rules and regulations. Some uh, focus on religious values, family values, and, and so on. But in U.S., all public companies uh, uh, should have code of conduct. And the SEC require that code of, code of conduct, code of business conduct be prepared by management, approved by board of directors, communicated to everybody within the company, and certification of compliance being obtained. And certification of compliance with code of business conduct should be collected and eventually put in the ethics report. And the ethics report should be uh, assured by third party providers. Then for social or corporate social responsibility, defining company social responsibility, how well they fulfill their corporate social responsibility, and how to measure that, how to report that, and provide assurance. On this part, we have long way to go. We are not there yet. We are doing much better on environmental, because as I mentioned, we have ISO 14,000 now, 
on environmental auditing, management, accounting, risk, and also even in US, the SEC focusing on climate change uh, and global warming. And uh, it, this International Sustainability Accounting Standard Board has already won guidelines on climate change. So we are doing much better. So I'm hoping that in near future, we will have some environmental reporting that we be uh, also audited by CPAs. The bottom line is that the companies that focus on business with purpose, impact investing, tone at the top, focusing on planet, people, profit, prosperity, right? They can stay in the business longer and when they stay in the business longer, they add to their bottom line earnings. So even the shareholders would benefit from it. And that makes common sense. Are we there yet? No. Are we going there? Yes. We are moving toward that direction. Hopefully. In my judgment. But uh, I'm publishing books on sustainability and doing research. So of course I'm very optimistic about the future of business sustainability. There are some that are not really optimistic. In terms of research, and this is very important, as of uh, now, uh, I see more research on CSR and ESG, more than 200. Basically, overall, the majority of these studies show positive association between CSR, ESG, and financial performance market performance, cost of capital, tax avoidance, and those kind of things. So overall results are good. That if you focus on sustainability and ESG, you can improve financial performance group and, and market performance and everything else. I summarized these studies in 2016, but recently uh, the others in 2021 have a good summary of all this research published in review of accounting studies. And I recommend you just go there and look at these studies and their impact. In terms of tips for CEOs and CFOs, again, they should focus on sustainability, the concept of profit with purpose, the concept of impact investing, and integrate sustainability into the business culture. Uh, uh, business environment, corporate culture, and supply chain management, basically. Uh, in the last part, uh, I'll focus on future of accounting education and business education. And basically, I'll summarize that within a couple of minutes, because I know you're getting tired. You want to go to the reception, right? There's a reception. No? <laughs> uh, recently, I'm working on a, a paper that talking about the future of uh, business and accounting education and the area of focus. Uh, and I basically abbreviated that into A, B, C, D, T, S. A stands for artificial intelligence. As you know, artificial intelligence is having impact on every aspect of our life, from medic, medical or medicine to uh, business, everything. Uh, I gave an example to Peter the other day. Even in education, I was doing a very quantitative research and I was trying to make sure that our model sounds economic, economically and statistically. So I had a couple of issues, econometrics issues. I, take, I took those issues to two professors, econometrics professors, and discussed with them. and said, can you help me with that? After a couple of days, they said, no, 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 your model sounds OK. Then the variables make sense and everything. And then I said, OK. Then I talked to my co-author in Australia, 
we went to chat GDP and put the same question on chat GDP. We got three pages of how to do things. You can use chat GDP to write a paper, dissertation. But I, and even with my, my son works at Harvard University, the School of Public Health at Harvard University, which is top position. And he is saying that he is using chat GDP for many other so artificial intelligence affects the business thing that we do. And it's, it's just uh, machine learning, uh, the coding. And, 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 but the concern is that when these computers learn from each other and they learn fast, they may overcome human beings' ability and, and judgment. There was one story that uh, uh, basically was uh, happened in, in the army that the, the uh, artificial intelligence help drawn to target a point here, but AI doesn't tell you how to get into point A. It may get to point A, B, C, D, and then A, and the the process is in a, in a black box. And God help if the computers learn from each other exponentially, and and that's what's going to happen. That's why you see that uh, many uh, high-tech individuals uh, talking about the concerns that they have with AI. But overall, I find it very, very useful uh, uh, in terms of any fields, business, medicine, and, and everything else that we do, the research and everything. So for that reason, AI should be integrated into the accounting curriculum. We need to talk to our students about artificial intelligence and the impact that it would have on the future future uh, um, uh, performance of students. Because our job is to train the most competent and ethical future business leaders or so we have to be on the top of that and teach them about artificial intelligence and the use of it. The other one is blockchain technology. Uh, blockchain technology been advanced in the past several years. Basically, to summarize that, all the transactions from beginning toward the end can be traced and verified. For example, the manufacturers in China, when getting raw materials, will create a block there, and that can be verified to producing products, delivering the products through FedEx to US customers. The whole process can be traced and basically verified. And I talked to uh, several partners of the accounting firms and said, what do you think is going to happen? Don't you think that the blockchain make your job less relevant? If all transactions from the beginning toward the end can be traced and verified, what's the need for the audit? And they said, uh-uh. We have already created blockchain technology division within our accounting firm, and especially KPMG is very good in that, and PwC. PwC is also doing that, and we are training our staff to do that. So that gave me the example. I said, when Excel came in first, they said the job of accountants is done. No, that helped us to do a better job. So with blockchain technology, and we have to teach that. One other issue, is COVID-19 and impact of it. Uh, uh, at our university for several years, courses were online. Uh, still, we have online courses, and it's gonna stay with the university. Not, more than 50% of courses that we uh, offer are online. I teach online courses, everybody else do that. So COVID-19 made it more feasible for us to move toward virtual presentation and classes. Uh, data analytics and data science is the most important thing. For example, at University of Memphis, we start offering data analytics course in accounting. But to me, it's like ethics course. Many years ago, we offered standalone ethics course that all the finance 
students, accounting, supply chain, management can take that course. Now we are integrating ethics into all courses. So supply chain management should be, integ I mean, uh, uh, data analytics and data science should be integrated into all disciplines and all courses. And that's the future of the use of uh, uh, data science and data analytics. Uh, T stands for technical skills, depends on the disciplines in management, accounting, finance. We prepare students for the technical knowledge. Either in finance, economics, accounting, we have all the accounting standards, auditing standards. In finance, we teach them portfolio management, all sort of things. That's technical. And one other thing that become more popular nowadays, and when I talk to the partners of CPA firms, they usually make the comments that your accounting graduates do have sufficient knowledge of accounting, but they lack communication skills social skills, writing skills, oral presentations. And that's what we need to teach our students. And I call that soft skills, including communication, oral presentation, networking becomes so important nowadays. So these skills are, I think are important for us to integrate into the curriculum. Of course, I have a slide on artificial intelligence machine learning, computer uh, vision, uh, the language and, and, and so on, the coding and everything else, uh, blockchain technology, the advancement of that, especially with the accounting firms is very significant. And COVID-19 had three impacts on the county education. How we deliver our courses, what to deliver, and for some accreditations and, and other things, Everything is virtual. So that's the impact of COVID-19 and data analytics and data science I mentioned to you. Technical skills depends on the discipline of the business students, soft skills, communication and, and everything else. So that's basically future of the business. The businesses should be more resilient because you see more crises from government, non-government, uh, uh, everywhere. And, and the businesses should be resilient to deal with this crisis. Business uh, models on transformation, the use of technology, uh, going concern or continuity of the business, recovery after damages, cost control, cash management, lean management. Even at the universities, I mentioned that I'm chairing Budget and Finance Committee of Faculty Senate. During the pandemic, I was asked by the provost to review financial, educational, and governance sustainability of all academic affairs units. 51 departments, 12 colleges. Uh, I got all the senators involved to do SWOT analysis, and I got their reports and compiled the reports but having to talk to the deans and telling the deans that you're doing something wrong, especially coming from faculty, I had to use diplomacy to get to them. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that even at the university level, we focus on sustainability, financial sustainability of university, educational sustainability of university based on these five skills and governance, shared governance. In US, faculty participate in many strategic decisions at the university level. We have the faculty senate, which is strong. And, 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 and that's why we call it shared governance. Uh, and, and that is important. And believe me, when I did my review, I used lean management, uh, cost control, continuous improvement, even for education, I had a hard time to educate, for example, psychology professors about lean. But they thought that lean management is just cutting cost, 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 cost. No, or cutting programs. No. But I had to go through that process. So what I'm saying is sustainability 
has implications not only for businesses, but also education and everything else. And depends on how you use that. Take over from my talk. Again, I'm hoping that I was able to communicate with you in this one hour the importance of business sustainability, ESG sustainability, how it can be promoted, integrated into corporate culture, business environment, and also financial uh, reporting, and so on. And uh, thank you for your attention. I have one question asked here. If the red house was made of red bricks and yellow house was made of uh, yellow bricks and, and blue house made of the blue bricks, what would be the greenhouse made out of? And the answer is glass. <laughs> Again, thank you for your attention. I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity to visit your university. And hopefully, I will see you again some other times. If there is any question, anything that you need to ask, please don't hesitate. So I'm going to ask uh, Professor Zabi. Uh, All right, go ahead. On this like new curriculum, like, future uh, disciplines that you can add in maybe on in Memphis University or other universities, are you seeing that the university or the department are like changing the curriculum? including these new disciplines or they are making the students to go to another department and like uh, have this class like about uh, artificial intelligence. So are you guys like adding one class of artificial intelligence it's or? A wonderful question. At University of Memphis, like other universities, we encourage integration and in, uh, interdisciplinary uh, curriculum and research. Uh, for example, when we have sustainability at University of Memphis, the, the environmental department, psychology department, finance department, supply chain department, we are all working together. So in terms of in interdisciplinary research, in terms of the education, for example, one example, data science and data analytics. Not many accounting professors are rich in this area that can offer a standalone course. So what we do is we ask what we call it BIT, Business Information Technology, which used to be Information System Department, to help us in having these courses. Uh, in accounting, when we have different disciplines, for MBA course as more important, or executive MBA, you take the best of every department's courses and integrate them into executive MBA or MBA courses or PhD courses. Yes, I'll see more integration and interdisciplinary research and teaching than before. Because you cannot know everything. Okay, thank you. I don't think they are kind of shy, so I'm going to keep asking because I have a, like one or two questions. Sure. Uh, my second question is about regulation. Do, uh, regulation. Oh, regulation. Do you think like regulation is, is a solution or one of the solutions for uh, the integrated reporting or sustainability, uh, I don't know, operations, you know? Uh, let me answer this question by looking at European regulation versus U.S. regulation. European corporate governance rules and regulations, or even sustainability, is that is more of voluntary. You comply with those rules and regulations, or explain why not. We call that principles-based rules and regulations. They create some principles. Companies and organizations have to follow these principles or explain why they cannot do it. 
On the other hand, in the US, we have more of mandatory rules and regulation, SEC, and we call this US system rules-based approach. There are some rules and regulations that everybody should comply with. Non-compliance would is not acceptable and create fines and, 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 and all these problems. So that's rules-based. So which one is better, the principles-based approach to regulation or rules-based? I believe that principle-based could work much better but is also subject to different interpretation and fraudulent activities. On the other hand, when you have rules-based approach, fraud, fraudsters, they're always one step ahead of regulators. You create these rules and regulation and they find a way to bypass it to achieve their purpose. For example, in accounting, you remember those uh, lease, capital lease, uh, standards or rules, you have to, uh, it has to be 75% of the, the total lease agreements and all sort of thing. KPMG did a study that those companies, they manage their capital lease to the point that would reach 74.9%, but not 75%. So it's always people, Creative, I call that creative accounting. <laughs> they find a way to bypass the rules and regulation. In the US, and when I was with the SEC and PCAOB, we discussed that. If you look at, for example, if you look at all these scandals in US and regulations, uh, in 1920s, we had this, uh, black uh, uh, market, whatever, when uh, all these scandals happened and investors lost their confidence in financial reporting and the capital market, and the Congress came up with the SEC rules of 1934 and 1933. So rules, rules and regulations follow the scandals that already happened, right? And then we got into 1960s, and we have these uh, uh, saving and loan scandals, and then more regulations. Then companies complain that regulations are too many regulations. They relax the regulation. We got into financial crisis of Enron, WorldCom, and global crisis, uh, crossing and others. And as a result, investors lost their confidence in financial market and financial reporting, and we had sarbanes oxley and, and some complained that sarbanes oxley has so many rules and regulations, we relaxed that one, we got into uh, the banking industry problems and crisis during 2017-19 or something. And then we had Dodd-Frank Act in US. And then after that, rules and regulations, so what I'm saying is rules and regulations just follow the crisis. It goes up and down. So that is not good. What we've been working on, and I work with the SEC, that rules and regulations should be proactive rather than reactive. You have to prevent crisis before they happen. Not after the Black Friday, Monday, you will have SEC rules, no or after Enron case and Arthur Anderson, Sarbanes Oxley. So rules and regulations should be proactive, should be cost efficient and effective. Peter, you mentioned something that these standards are hard to comply with. Yes, any rules and regulations should be cost effective and efficient. And that's why in the uh, SEC, there's a division of economic, uh, 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 division of the SEC, one section working on feasibility of a standard or rules and regulations, whether they are cost effective or not. And Peter, one other thing that you mentioned, PR, I'm sorry, I said Peter. PR is scalable. You cannot apply the same rules and regulations to large companies than the small companies because the small companies and especially in uh, developing countries do not have the resources to comply. So answering your questions, first I'm in favor of 
principles-based rules and regulations rather than rules-based rules and regulations. Second, regulations should be proactive, cost-efficient, effective, scalable. Then it may work. But again, implementation. You know, I can't have all these rules and regulations and those who are in charge of implementing them, if they decide to override those rules and regulations, they can't do that. So you're dealing with human beings and human beings are greedy. And that's why we see all these problems. And God didn't create us perfectly. <laughs> we can do crazy things. Yes. Of rights in the sustainability in USA. Right. Uh, is have a regulation about the credits, credits of the of the carbon. Oh, in this particular cases that relates to a particular company, I don't have much information, but you are talking about the carbon uh, initiatives and those kind of things. Um, unfortunately, I don't have much information on that, but uh, I'll be glad to go online and find out more information for you. But the, these uh, companies have their own specific um, uh, uh, initiatives uh, to deal with ESG in different ways. But currently, like I said, the SEC is moving toward that direction, but how soon will we have more effective rules and regulations? Um, I don't know, time will tell. Any other question? The students, master and PhD students, one advice based on experience in your career to the future, to their future, what do you say to them? Wow, that's a tough question. If I had to start over and get in my PhD, I'll tell you how, what I would have done. First of all, as a PhD student, you have to think of your education as an investment. You invest three, four, five years of your life, and you're hoping the payback would be for many years to come. So when you get into a master program or a PhD, look at more of that you're investing. You're investing your education with good payback. In order to get a good payback on your education, regardless of what university you go to, you have to spend four or five years in a place. So if I had to do it over, I would go to the toughest university possible in your country or overseas. Because when you graduate, for example, from Chicago, University of Chicago, Texas, Harvard, yeah, the perception is that you are good. And you start from here. When you start, you graduate from secondary universities, you have to prove that you can be good. And it may take time to get to this level and advance. And besides, high quality universities have more resources. They give higher stipend to PhD students. They have better quality faculty. They have better databases. They have everything else. So you get a better training anyway. The perception is very important. Whether you start here or here. You spend the same four years, but when you graduate from Chicago, you are here. Does it make sense? That's my suggestion. That's what I would have done. But I'm too old to start over. <laughs> No. 
resources, give more stipend to students, they have better faculty, then mentor students, and all sorts of things. Let's go have okay. fun, reception. I want to just say thank you again, Professor Zabi. It was a pleasure to have you here. You are always welcome. I hope we can see you again. I convince you that uh, you would invite me and I will come. Yeah, let's take a picture. Uh, before the picture, uh, I want to uh, say a few words about Alini, Professor Alini. She's right there. Please, Professor Alini, come here. Professor Alini was our coordinator from our Congress last year. She did a, a great job. And this year, Professor Marcelo is doing the job. So Professor Marcelo, please. Uh, so our event is going to happen in October. We are now open for submissions. This is the last uh, week to receive the papers. And I'm going to ask for a few words from Professor Marcelo. He can speak Portuguese. We have, we have like a few viewers. Not, not me. I don't speak Portuguese. <laughs> you, you can not speak. yet, but I'm Olá. learning. Not yet, but I'm learning. But you can, yeah. you can. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, I'm very glad to coordinate uh, ADCONT, our Congress, uh, at this year. And I'm very grateful from Alini, Lucas, and all group that are Carla, that are making this Congress with me. Uh, it's a great experience. Uh, and we are uh, with submissions open until uh, 21st July uh, for everybody. And, and we will meet online. It's an online congress at this year uh, on between 23rd and 25th October. October 23rd and 25th. And you are welcome. Good. Aline, please. A reception. I hope you all enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations for your work. Yeah.